Our last presentation will be by Thomas Sturgeon, Technical Advisor at ITOPF. ITOPF is a membership organization that is maintained by the world's ship owners and their insurers um, on a non-profit basis to promote effective response to maritime spills of oil, chemicals and other substances. And Thomas will speak about lessons learned from recent incidents. Thomas, you have 15 minutes. Thank you very much. And thank you for the intro. Can you uh, see my screen? And is it in presenter view? Uh, yes and yes. And we can hear you. Perfect. Thank you. <laughs> so, um, yeah, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, as said, I'm a technical advisor for ITOP. And amongst other services, we respond to marine pollution incidents, uh, both on site and remotely. Um, our aim is to promote best practice and provide scientific and experience-based advice to assist states and organizations when conducting a response. Um, so to, to set some context, I suppose, with approximately 80% of global trade by volume uh, being transported by ships, um, maritime trade is often quoted as being the backbone of global trade and the global economy. Uh, but unfortunately, as we know, cargo spills do occur. Over a 12 year period, um, 100, sorry, 1,380 containers are lost overboard every year. And while the size of container ships have been increasing over the past 50 years, the number of crew per vessel has been decreasing. Um, concerningly, in 2020, there was reportedly one shipboard fire every two weeks and a major fire every 60 days. Um, additionally, the demand and production of plastics continues to steadily rise. So as a consequence, there continues to be a risk of spills. And recently we have seen an increase in the spills of plastic pellets um, as previously discussed by the other um, lecturers. So, uh, and, and just to emphasize that these are the primary feedstock for um, the manufacture of most plastic products. So the lessons learned in this presentation will focus um, mostly on, on plastic spills uh, of plastic pellets, which are also known um, interchangeably as as plastic resin sometimes or nurdles um, and they have various other names. So this picture is of the Express Pearl um, which was a ship that got into difficulty in Sri Lanka this year and uh, with a fire and um, this is the same vessel several days uh, later after a considerable firefighting efforts. So to provide a few examples of past incidents, this slide presents um, some of the cases where plastics, among other substances, have unfortunately been released into the marine environment. Uh, from the top left to the bottom right, you have the MSC Susanna, uh, the Kami, two images from the Express Pearl, and finally the MSC Chitra, which is the bottom right. And here you can see the geographic spread of some of the key incidents that have occurred since 1998 involving plastic pollution, um, which ITOP has been involved in to some degree. Uh, that's either on site or remotely or, uh, or both. So what lessons have we learned from these cases? Well, first and foremost, um, as previously has been mentioned, prevention is better than cure. Uh, according to the National Cargo Bureau, the misdeclaration of cargo and the improper stowage of containers appears to be a problem. Um, for responders, this makes container cleanup uh, that bit more difficult. Plastic pellets are not classified as an IMDG cargo, as we've heard, and therefore there's no specific rules for this cargo type. However, some carriers have voluntarily adopted best practice guidance for the carriage of nurdles. For example, um, organization that provides such guidance is Operation Clean Sweep, which has published guidance documents detailing measures to prevent marine plastic pollution. Um, for example, uh, Operation Clean Sweep advised not stowing resin containers on deck and instead placing uh, resin or, or pellet containers in ship's holds or away from the side of the vessel. So unfortunately, although uh, such measures reduce the risk of spills, they do not remove it completely. And when these incidents do occur, past cases have shown that quick source control um, in terms of lost container location, containment and recovery um, is crucial. And this is because uh, slightly damaged containers can cause continuous releases of pellets uh, for long periods of time up until they're located, contained and recovered. Um, to help locate lost containers, modeling can be done. 
um, we can provide this service and there are various other organizations that can do so. Um, but uh, and this, this can be done if you have the time and the location uh, from the ship's log. But modeling can be hard because of many unknowns uh, such as container buoyancy, but it will enable you to narrow down the area to allow surveying vessels to locate them, divers to contain them and vessels to recover them uh, weather permitting um, if the sea state allows. So this is an image from the Express Pearl case and uh, a key point to note is that container location may be possible, but following a fire or significant damage, um, specific container identification may not be. So the container identification number may actually be burnt off. So although rapid response and cleanup is really important, uh, it's worth bearing in mind um, that if there's a chance for containers to contain HNS or products um, that are confirmed uh, or to be contaminated with HNS, a precautionary approach needs to be taken and uh, ap appropriate PPE needs to be worn by um, responders and uh, sort of defined procedures followed. So a spill of plastic pellets um, often affects a wide geographic area as we've seen from the Transcarrier incident and, uh, and various others, including the Express Pearl, and it results in a protracted shoreline response. Um, this is a map of the nodal contamination following the Express Pearl case, where the colors equate to high, medium or low contamination. And to quantify high, medium and low, um, contamination shoreline surveyors were asked to see how many nodals they could collect in, uh, in two minutes from a section of, of stereotypical shoreline um, of that contamination and weigh them. So high therefore equates uh, to 30 grams of nodals collected by one individual in two minutes, medium five to 30 grams and low less than five grams, therefore allowing shoreline cleanup prioritization according to the level of contamination. And this sort of just helps to quantify, um, quantify uh, sort of what you're seeing on the graph, but also um, standardize it across people. And there was training provided for, so everyone standardized this approach. Um, because there can be a high variability in the distribution of nodals and recharge can occur um, throughout the tidal cycle, a cyclical process of surveying and site prioritization is often required. And um, that was seen to have worked well in the Transcarrier case and has been uh, adopted in various other instances as well. Um, and past cases have shown that the best forum for prioritization is during regular instant command meetings. So for example, that's daily during the initial instant phase to ensure all stakeholders are aligned, everyone that's involved um, can get an up-to-date briefing of the situation. And such meetings facilitate sort of good dissemination of up-to-date information, um, are a good forum to discuss intergovernmental cooperation and uh, formal requests for assistance that may be coming from local organizations, NGOs or assisting governments. So uh, following the stranding of plastics, burial can occur after one tidal cycle or it can take weeks or even months um, as we've seen and there may be cycles of accretion or erosion uh, in relation to met ocean conditions. So having cleanup teams that can mobilize quickly uh, has, has really proven to be highly beneficial to maximize the recovery before it then um, becomes buried or mobilizes elsewhere. Uh, these images show one of the worst affected um, sections of the shoreline immediately following the incident and several months afterwards. And despite extensive, uh, very extensive cleanup efforts uh, from the outset, continuous wave action still resulted in burial, uh, just owing to the quantity that was spilt. So I think this image here is a, a good example of, of burial after two to three weeks. Um, at, following the spill at one specific site. This was the worst affected site, uh, and which I think really emphasizes how difficult it can be to conduct a cleanup. Burial of 10 to 15 centimeters has been quite common and burial of nurdles down to a meter has even been observed at the worst affected site. So I think it's also worth mentioning that for instance, we have been involved in um, at sea response has not been considered a realistic response option. Although many nurdles float and uh, because of their white color, um, and they're very small, obviously, it's very difficult to see them in the water and this has hampered um, recovery amongst other reasons as well. Um, also the small mesh size that you'd need if you were going to use a net. So what have we learned when it comes to cleanup? Um, well, past events have shown that manual recovery is one of, uh, in one form or the other, has been found to be the most effective and pragmatic cleanup technique particularly when coupled with vacuum systems or assisted by a mechanical plant. 
Quick mobilization teams can recover debris from the strand line and move it above the high tide mark, both to avoid remobilization and burial. And uh, one of the key reasons why um, recovery by personnel has been the most effective is simply because personnel can access most shoreline types and they can selectively recover nurdles while reducing the collection of unpolluted material. Um, so, so what have we learned in terms of mechanical recovery? Well, past cases have shown that uh, mechanical recovery really does um, and can work well. Um, it can be highly efficient for recovery and separation of nurdles from sand. For example, uh, beach cleaners on flat manicured beaches when there's um, a little bit of moisture in, in the uh, sand um, can be efficient. However, mechanical equipment can fail and it's often not as selective as manual recovery. Uh, the key issues that um, have been found during past cases is that although mechanical devices enable rapid recovery of material, they are limited by site access and often lead to the collection of a lot of clean material. And this clean material requires separation at a later date. And this adds to the volume of waste to be disposed of, uh, if it can't be segregated, that is. And we would always advise um, segregation. And, uh, this is, and we've seen this in, in many of the past cases as well, um, either via water baths or, or series of sieving um, separation devices. And careful use is therefore required uh, to ensure selective debris recovery um, from the outset. I mean, it re reduces a lot of the effort later on uh, if separation is required. So the bottom right image with the front end loader is a good example of how mechanical recovery can be really efficient um, as it comes in and skims the surface. But what we have seen in the past is, is uh, if the, um, the operator hasn't been briefed in advance and dig too deep, then it can uh, lead to the recovery of a lot of clean sand, for example, which adds to the workload later down the line. So vibrating tables, durable trommels, and beach cleaning devices uh, can be effective um, at a later date, but often manual recovery is the most appropriate during the initial uh, phase. So endpoints. Um, the decision of setting endpoints and terminating a response is a difficult one. Uh, spills of plastic pellets are, as we know, time consuming and labor intensive to clean up. And the quantity spilt, um, nature of the shoreline and the area impact may often mean that practically collecting every last plastic pellet, unfortunately, is not achievable, um, which is why prevention is easier than cure. It may also not be the net um, provide net environmental benefit if, if it's continued too long. Uh, so some proposals we've seen involved recording the quantity of nurdles collected per person per day in kilo kilograms or grams in order to determine um, when there are diminishing returns. For one specific case, workers were collecting 380 grams per worker per day but approximately one year later, they were sporadically recovering between 120 and 15 grams per person per day, um, which is where this graph starts around one year after the start of cleanup. Um, what the graph shows is that the volume of plastics collected per person per day decreases and eventually starts to plateau. And at which point the difficult decision as to when to terminate the cleanup has to be made considering the net environmental benefit. And, I, and we heard that um, in the Norway scenario, I think it was half a litre per person per day um, was considered that threshold. Another technique um, discussed has been to offset the plastic pollution by additional collection of non-instant related plastic, uh, which is easier to collect and will inevitably fragment into microplastics if it's not recovered, that is. Um, and this attempt to find the best solution with the maximum environmental benefit, however, does obviously introduce challenges and um, various approaches are, uh, have been proposed and have been implemented. So this image is just a, a, um, a picture, I believe, of a fishing vessel which has been adapted to collect macroplastics, so the larger plastics floating on the water, um, to offset um, the, the nurdles or plastic pellets that are more difficult to collect. So what is the impact? Well, the reality is that there's extensive literature on the impacts of marine plastics. Uh, they can attract environmental pollutants and be consumed by mar marine animals and birds but we haven't seen any evidence of direct impacts to fauna and flora directly following large plastic spills. Now that's not to say that there isn't any plastic, any impact um, from these plastic spills. It simply means we haven't received peer reviewed scientific studies immediately following large plastic pollution events to make conclusive assessments. Um, the picture on the left is a sad, but interesting one. Uh, initial reactions may lead you to believe that the fish died due to plastic ingestion. 
but this image could also be the result of nurdle contamination post-mortem um, if the fish, for example, was washed into a nurdle deposit after death, uh, which is highly, highly plausible in the um, Express Pearl case with such quantities. This is why proper studies, including post-mortem inspections of the stomachs are required uh, to draw a proper conclusion. Um, and I think the transcarrier incident uh, in Norway, Sweden and Denmark was a, a good example of this, where um, some studies were conducted um, of birds and fish and looked into this in detail. Uh, what we can say is, generally speaking, that more comprehensive studies are needed to get a complete understanding of the potential impacts. But in the meantime, preventative measures should continue to be the focus. So the final lesson learnt that I think is worth mentioning is that plastics or pure plastics such as nurdles appear not to be classified as a hazardous noxious substance under the HNS Convention 1996 and the 2010 protocol or dangerous goods under the IMDG code. Um, although they are considered HNS according to the OPRC um, HNS protocol. If the plastic pellets become contaminated with dangerous goods or HNS during a vessel collision or fire, there is the potential for the plastics to become toxic and a vehicle for these substances to move around the marine environment. And once in the marine environment, there is the potential for them to move into different environmental compartments, such as biota. Um, additional debris contaminated with toxic substances adds complexity to the incident. Uh, this influences the PPE worn by cleanup personnel, can cause delays in finding labs for toxicological analysis, and introduces complexities for waste disposal. So I think it's something to bear in mind when conducting contingency planning and revising documentation and preparing for uh, the unfortunate next spill um, if and when it occurs. Thank you, that's uh, the end of my presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you, Thomas. Um, Cheers. And thank you. Um, and thank you for all the presentations.